All right, MAS 343 students, welcome to Chapter 1, Introduction to System Analysis and Design. Let's start off with some terminology. You may or may not be familiar with some of these, but we're going to start off with information technology, IT. We hear this all the time. We have IT departments, we have IT people, but what is information technology? Well, it's hardware, software, products and services. It's the devices and programs working together to allow us to accomplish almost anything. If you want to simply print something out, if you want to do online banking, all of that is information technology working together. What about system analysis and design? Well, that's our step-by-step -step process for developing information systems. These systems need to be built, they need to be programmed, and there are a footpath, if you will, of how do we develop these systems. And we're also going to hear about system analysts. This is a growing career field and, and quite a good career field to go into. These are the individuals that plan and develop and maintain these information. They manage IT products, they do all the meetings. Those are, when you think of your stereotypical corporate IT guy, those are system analysts. They have a lot of, they have their hands in a lot of different programs and they really run a lot of business information technology. You're probably familiar with the term point of sale system or POS. And these are the terminals you see at a checkout. Well, that's an entire system. It's related components and software that produce specific results. And the result of that system is well, multiple. One is to allow you to successfully buy the item you want and complete the transaction process. But on the back end, we are also maintaining the database that, that store uses saying, all right, this many items were sold today at this price. This is our profit, less, you know, different fees we have. And how many do we have? How many more items do we need to order? Like we talked about before, many things go into an information system. The most obvious would be hardware and software, but we also need data. Think of that point of sale system. We need to know the corresponding prices to each UPC code. That way we can charge people correctly and make a profit. We also need certain processes. What are our rules, if you will, for the data? How does the software and hardware interact? How do we manage inputs and outputs? And finally, the most important part, and honestly, the most critical part of any system is the people. We have to make sure that everybody who interacts with our information system understand how that system works. Can they use it? Can they troubleshoot it if needed? Can they just function with it daily? You know, there's a couple times, um, you know, a store I go to a lot, they change their point of sale systems. They got new cash registers and it was painful. The, um, the cashiers were not trained properly on how to use these systems. The credit card reader never worked. It really ruined that shopping experience for a lot of people. So you can have the best system in the world, but if your people don't know how to use it, that system's going to fail. When we're talking about the hardware layer, I want to draw your attention to Moore's Law. And that states that transistors on an integrated circuit chip double about every 24 months. So think of like processor speed. Moore's Law says that every 24 months, processor speed would double. Now, this hasn't necessarily held true in recent time. We have seen processor speed, you know, go up exponentially in a very short period of time. But the key takeaway to Moore's Law is Technology is developing and constantly progressing. We can never be stagnant. We can never let our hardware stagnate. Because when we do, we miss out on a lot of great features that our customers would want. At the software level, that controls the hardware. Hardware by itself doesn't do anything. We need software to tell the hardware what to do. We need the software to manage and process the data. By processing data, it's using the hardware. All of our data is stored in tables. That's the best way to organize, and quite frankly, it's really the only way that your system is going to be able to understand that data. Look back at that point of sale system. That data is corresponding UPC codes to items we have, to a name of that item. Maybe it's Coca-Cola, Pepsi, some chips. How many do we have in stock? What is the MSRP, manufacturer's recommended retail price? That's the price we charge our people. And we can break it down even further to how much profit do we get for that item? What is the maximum capacity we can hold in store? 
when do we need to order more? You can see this data is just exponentially with that one example. When we talk about processes, these are the tasks and functions that we need to perform to achieve specific results. This is kind of the rules in how we operate. Uh, and people, these are our stakeholders. They're individuals interested in an information system. And that phrase may not really relate it because you might think, oh, well, the average cashier may not be really interested in the register she uses, but they're definitely a stakeholder because they need to operate that for their job. They need to operate it successfully for customer satisfaction. So we call them stakeholders. That's really anybody who interacts with this information system. A huge influencer is obviously the internet. The internet has changed the way we do business over the past 10, 20, 30 years. And think about the way it increases globalization for small companies. It is totally possible for Genetto's up the road from campus, for those of you on campus, it is totally possible for Genetto's to sell globally. You know, they could sell Genetto certs to Russia, to Korea, to Japan. That would be inconceivable 40 years ago. Uh, even probably even less for, for smaller companies. So the internet has really changed everything in e-commerce. It's developed e-commerce. We've had commerce before, but now we have electronic commerce. If you haven't taken an e-commerce class, there's different rules and regulations we have to follow in the world of e-commerce that a strictly brick and mortar store doesn't really need to need to follow. A couple different sectors I really want to focus on, uh, and you're going to see these terms not only in this class, but in some other classes, but B2C, B2Bs, these are categories that we need to interact businesses into. So business to consumer, that's a company that does a single uh, session that a customer can purchase from. A business per has an interaction directly with the customer. B2B, this is business to business. So these are more back end stuff, you know, supply chain management. Company A is buying something from company B, and company B may turn around and sell that directly to a customer. When we're modeling business operations, we're really breaking down step by step what that company does. If you ever develop a business plan, maybe you want to start a small business, these are things that you really need to analyze. Uh, your business profile, that's just kind of a really uh, you know 30,000 foot view of what's your mission. What uh, are your products and services? Who do you think your customers are going to be? Who are your competitors? Where are you getting the items? And where do you see your company moving in the future? Usually a, a five or a 10 year plan. Uh, the business process is very specific transactions and events that kind of describe that. So we bring in uh, wickets from the supplier. They go in our stock system. They go out to our consumers. We're going to talk a lot about the SDLC, the System Development Lifecycle. And this is how we plan, analyze, design, implement, and support an information system. So this is kind of from birth to implementation and not end support, but user support for whatever the system is. This is really the, the birth through operation of a new information system. We're also going to talk about Agile, too. Agile is really a very interesting thought process where we just constantly prototype and learn from our mistakes to make that better to get to an end product. A lot of companies will pick one of these routes and go, maybe they're just an agile and they just keep prototyping. Maybe they want some more structure in their processing and developing. Uh, but these are terms we're going to talk about a lot. They're terms that you're going to find more uh, in your studies and when you get out into business. We talked about prototyping with agile development, and this really deserves some more time because a lot of times you will see program managers need a new system. Maybe it's a database, maybe it's just some other system to accomplish a tasking. And a lot of times you'll hear them say, well, just give me something, make something happen. And that's kind of how prototyping works, right? We know a little bit of the requirements of the system. We know a little bit of the function. So we're going to make something. It's not going to be a polished product, but it'll work. There's air quotes around that. It'll work. Um, if we take our time, if time is available, and you know we do some research ahead of time, you can really develop a very workable prototype that could mimic what your end product would be. But the problem with prototyping is it's very easy to jump to conclusions or 
not understand the final product or even the question at hand because you're given a short list of needs and wants. You will develop a system and upon presenting it, maybe the stakeholders don't like it. And because they don't fully understand software development or system design, they think that's the end goal and you can get, you could start off on the wrong foot. Uh, so when you're doing prototyping only, you need to be very clear with your stakeholders that, you know, this is going to be a very early alpha release, pre-alpha release. And we need to explain these terms to them. They may not understand release terms. So you're going to say, look, this is, this is a really early model. We're working on it. Uh, it's a work in progress, if you will. Uh, critique it. Give me, give me valuable feedback on what you feel. We're going to go back to the drawing board and we'll come back with version two. I can't stress that first bullet point enough. I mean, this is an incredibly fast evolving field. Uh, yeah, it seems like every month there are new newsletters coming out, new trade manuals coming out, and you need to stay on top of this, especially if you find that this is, you know, more than 40% of your job. Uh, or if you are, you know, a, a manager in an IT department, you really need to stay on top of everything. Uh, people who cannot maintain certifications, gain certifications, or just even gain knowledge or practical experience are, are really going to be behind the power curve. And that's not meant to scare you in this class. You do not need to be, you know, a computer whiz in this class. You don't need to be on top of all the trends. But what you'll find if down the road, if this turns into your job, if you are a manager, a program manager, an IT manager, you, you need to be a jack of all trades and you need to have a pretty comprehensive understanding of many topics. And honestly, I think that's one of the exciting things about this field is because it is so fast. Uh, we talked about a couple trends here, Agile specifically, really focus on Agile. Uh, you're just going to see a lot, a lot more of that. So that's going to wrap up our PowerPoint for Chapter 1. Like I said before, I don't go over all the slides in the PowerPoint. I pick out things that, that I feel we need to talk on. And by no means are these videos a substitute for you going over the PowerPoints yourself or reading the chapters. But please continue on to Chapter 2. As always, if you have any questions, please reach out.